Welcome, welcome to the evening show with Jackie Brambles, the home of great conversations with your favourite living legends of the 70s, 80s and 90s. And we have another corker for you this evening, as you may have guessed. From tonight's opening track, Checkered Love. Uh, tonight's special guest shot to fame in 1981 with a debut single that sold over three million copies. And that was just the start of her amazing career, which continues to this day for the one and only Kim Wilde. Hello, Jackie. I'm clutching my interview prep sheet. <laughs> you are a good girl. Top of the class. I oh, know. <laughs> I was I was like last night and I thought right now I've really got to do this I've got to do this and it was I really enjoyed it because it was a trip down memory lane for me of you know checking out a few of the artists and the videos that I hadn't seen for a while it was a, it was a really lovely thing to do oh that's good news that's brilliant I'm so glad that you just moved there on the Zoom because just for a second it looked like you were sitting there naked. Woo-hoo! <laughs> 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 Which it could, that could have been the highest ranking uh, social media interaction ever. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> no, you could have, you could have uh, no, got me thinking now. Right. So, Kim, this is where we try to figure out how and when music entered the lives of our guests. I usually ask if people grew up in a musical household or not, but I don't have to ask you that because we all know you were surrounded by musicians all your life with your famous rock and roll star dad, Marty Wilde, and your mum, Joyce who was in an all-girl group. So there wasn't really a lot to rebel against, really. That's right, yeah. So I was never a rebel girl, you know. Um, when punk came along, I just, I loved it for what it was, not because it meant that I could um, hate my parents even more. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and, you know, in fact, it was Dad who was loving the Sex Pistols, you know, so it, there was no, yeah, no no um, rebelling to be done, um, which was good. That's, you know, a lot of that rebellious stuff is quite a, a bit boring anyway. Uh, yeah. Although, you know, I did rebel in other ways, of course. <laughs> there's, there's lots of very more secretive ways you can rebel without going into too many details. Details. We don't I, do that. I still don't want my parents to know about what I got up to when I was 16 years old. But yeah. And you also don't want your children to hear either. Ex- well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, growing up in music was wonderful, you know. The fact that my dad would be sitting on a sofa playing a guitar, perhaps writing a song, singing, that my mum would be um, harmonising with him all the time. Growing up in a house where if you sat in a car and went to, on that journey to Liverpool to see your grandparents, no one would be singing the melody in the car. Everyone would be pitching in with a... I mean, I know it sounds a bit von Trappy, but literally, you know, you never hear anyone singing a melody of a song in a car everyone's pitching a third above or below or some other harmonizing harmony um then yeah and then dad was on tv a lot and my you know as i got older my mates dads were going to work um or coming home from work when my dad was going to work obviously jumping in a car going off to do a gig what record would you pick then as a sort of a representation of childhood sort of a childhood song I always put my childhood into two different phases before, you know, London childhood and, and, and after London, London was up to about eight or nine years old and they were during the sixties. And then when I think of the sixties and being a young child, uh, you know, just listening to the artists like Jim Pitney yeah. and Cilla Black and, uh, Sandy Shaw and obviously all the Beatles. And, uh, but there was one song that stood out for me as a very young child, and that was Richard Harris's Mark MacArthur's Path. Was never waiting for us, MacArthur Park, which bizarrely got to number four in 1968. Apparently, uh, the result of an unlikely friendship between the actor Richard Harris and the esteemed songwriter Jimmy Webb, with a sprinkling of heavy drinking and an empty studio on top, uh, or so legend has it. But it's lodged right there in the memory banks of tonight's special guest, Kim Wilde. So that's your earliest recollection of a song that was around you as a kid, Kim, and, and I think... Most adults would say they started to get into music for themselves at about 12 or 13. But because you were already drenched in that rich musical heritage of your family, did that come at an earlier stage for you? Well, when I was about nine or 10, we moved from London to Hertfordshire. And that's when I started to get a real sense of who I was, Um, you know, that sort of 
baby child to child with an attitude. Um, and mm. so within a few years, um, after having been exposed to this incredible record collection that my parents owned, um, I really got into an album that they had by Elton John. And um, it was one of the early ones with your song on and a beautiful acoustic sounding album, just gorgeous. And I became an Elton John fan. And one of the first albums I bought with my own pocket money was Goodbye Yellow Brick Road by Elton John. And I guess I was about 13. I think it was 73, wasn't it, when it came out? Yeah. Oh, that's a, and, and should, we, should we play the title track for that one for you? You can play anything off that album. <laughs> It'll bring back gorgeous memories. When I gonna come down? When I... Greatest Hits Radio, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, the magnificent double album from 1973 by Elton John and a wonderful pick from tonight's very special guest on the evening show, Kim Wilde, and we'll be back to continue our great conversation with Kim next. Tonight's guest is one of our most beloved British pop stars. Yes, Kim Wilde is here. And we want to know who were her most beloved pop stars when she was a teenager. Do you remember, Kim, whose posters were up on your bedroom wall? Yes, I do remember. Um, you don't forget those posters. I certainly had one of Roy Wood. I, I, I ended up touring with Roy Wood. and uh, Oh, stage- wow, of Wizard. Yeah, and, with sta- and Status Quo was several years back, but we became well, good buddies. Um, and I just loved his voice. I loved his beautiful hair. I loved all his gorgeous makeup. Um, you know, great songs like See My Baby. Baby Jive, what a great track. Um, Ballpark Incident, just brilliant, brilliant songwriting songs. So I loved Roy Wood very much. I loved Bowie, of course, everyone loves Bowie. And um, I remember seeing him on Top of the Pops in 72. I was 12, um, because I was born in 60, just for clarification. And um, (laughs) uh, yeah, and I I remember, you know, falling in love with him too, you know, beautiful makeup all over his face. I guess I've always been a sucker for a boy with makeup. Bit of glam rock. I love glam rock, yeah. And I, I based quite a lot of my stage costumes on glam rock outfits that I saw during the 70s. Isn't that funny, the things that stick with us about, you know, what represents glamour, what represents rock and roll? Yes, and, and then, of course, there's that one t- tiny word that kind of encompasses it all, and it's pop. <laughs> 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 so let's talk about when you when you started to take music seriously. When did when did you know um, that you, you you wanted to sort of go into the family business if, if if you like? What age were you when you thought, yeah, I want to be on that stage, front and center? That's what I want to do. Well, it's interesting you say that because actually, all I really wanted to do was sing. And with my experience of learning how to uh, pitch harmonies, and my mother having been a session singer, and I knew that the money was good. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? I can pitch harmonies, and if I can get paid for doing that, um, then I would be very happy to be a session singer. And the whole thing about being on stage and being Kim Wilde was not something that was a dream, really. I wasn't, um, I didn't have ambitions to be a big, you know, famous star. I just wanted to to sing. Did you do have some, you know, fun work as a session singer then before before you became sort of known as a solo artist? Well, I did a bit of session work for my dad, um, obviously, because <laughs> uh, uh, not many people would let a 12-year-old into the studio. Um, but, um, yeah, so, no, I never got to I never got to fulfil that. Um, I, I did appear on a Johnny Hates Jazz record once. and um, Did you? Do you remember what Johnny Hates Jazz record it was? It was Turn Back the Clock. I wish that I could turn back the clock. So you're happily doing session work as a background singer, and I don't know if this is truth or myth, but the story goes that you were sort of discovered and became a pop star almost overnight. So what was happening was I was living at home post art foundation course and um, still living at home with my brother Ricky and he had started writing in a local studio to where we lived in Hertfordshire and had come up with a few songs which I was doing session work on and backing vocals on and really enjoying 
he got noticed by Mickey Most from Rat Records in London, the legendary Mickey Most, yeah. who saw Ricky's great talent and potential and got Ricky into his studio in London. And then Rick said, I'm doing some demos and um, my sister does session work. Can I get her in? So then I was just rowing myself in as a session singer for Rat Records, really. I wanted to sing on all of Mickey Most's stable of artists and get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then I turn up. And literally, it was like something out of a bunty annual. You know, I, I, I turned up and Mickey saw me and asked Ricky who I my, asked my brother who I was and do, can I sing? And the rest is history, really. Within a few short weeks, Kiss in America had been written by my brother Ricky and my father Marty. And, um, and I'd done the, we'd recorded it in Hertfordshire, not even in London. And uh, there you go. Then it all just started to kick off very quickly. What was that feeling like for you? Was it, you know, utter jubilation that this, you know, huge, quick turn of events was happening? Or was there any reticence on your part that you were like, oh, I'm not sure I actually signed up for this? Oh, no, no. I jumped into it with both feet. Yeah, I was just elated. I was 20 years old. Um, it was wonderful, you know, working with my brother, working with my father, you know, so my father's amazing songwriting talent and imagination. And at the time I wasn't writing songs, but I loved what was coming out of his mind and he knew me very well. Yeah. So he, you know, we had a, a very strong connection. I, I loved what he was coming out with. Looking out a dirty old window, Kids in America, a huge hit around the world, selling millions of copies, a music video on high rotation at MTV, and a star was born. So suddenly, Kim, you found yourself no longer the backing vocalist, but uh, front and centre. So who were your contemporaries then, Kim, Before, just before you sort of, you know, went absolutely stratospheric with Kids in America, just before we all found out who Kim Wilde was, when you were sort of looking to your left and your right, or, or possibly a step or two ahead, who was doing it, you know, really, really well? And, and you were getting excited thinking, oh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's what I want to do. Well, one of my, someone who I really looked up to was Kirsty McCall, because at the time she was about my age and she put out a song called They Don't Know. And I remember hearing it on Radio One, which was the main station in them days. And I remember thinking, wow, she's my age and she's writing this great pop stuff and she's, you know, she's doing it. She's out there yeah. actually doing it. This is really cool. So, yeah, I was, I really looked up to Kirsten and eventually got to know her well and had a, was very inspired by her to start my own songwriting, which I didn't do for a few years, but greatly inspired by Kirsty herself. And, um, and then I was a huge fan of Claire Grogan and the Altered Images. Um, and Claire and I have become good buddies too now. Um, I used to be a bit jealous because she always t- had a much better a smash hit front cover than I did. She, was, <laughs> she just always looked better on there. She, there's something just absolutely stunningly beautiful about the way she was and still is. Um, so yeah, that was kind of going on. Lots of, lots of great women in, in pop at that time. Don't Talk To Me About Love got to number seven in 1983 for Altered Images, fronted, of course, by Claire Grogan, who went from rival to really good mates with tonight's special guest, Kim Wilde. And we will be back with more great conversation from Kim next. Welcome back to the evening show with me, Jackie Brambles. And we're having a great conversation with my special guest tonight, Kim Wilde. Now, before the break, Kim, you were joking about comparing yours and Claire Grogan's smash hits covers. Uh, it, it's kind of hard, isn't it, to explain to younger music fans today just how powerful and how important that magazine was, not just to the readers, but to the industry. I mean, it was out every two weeks and it was it, so influential in making and breaking artists. Well, if I think back, isn't it curious that, you know, we were all buying one magazine, whereas now we're all, all on mobiles and social network and 
none of us are all looking at the same thing at all, even passing in, in a passing way. Like, you know, we all used to watch Top of the Pops. We all used to buy the NME. Yeah. We all used to buy Smash Hits. And now we don't all do all those things. So trying to have a sort of a consensus about what people are liking is, is, is harder, interesting, more challenging. So I think at the time, you know, with a song like Kids in America, it opened lots and lots of doors for me. And um, especially abroad, I spent a lot of time uh, traveling to Germany and Holland, especially France. And my life just kind of, you know, it wasn't just smash hits for me. It was like the biggest magazines all over the world. Yeah. And, and just and, and in the biggest way possible. Um, d- do you remember your first Top of the Pops? Oh, yeah, I do remember that my first Top of the Pops. I remember Madness were there. And um, I was a huge Madness fan, loved Scar, uh, loved the specials, loved the beat. Um, I was really um, in awe that they were all, but you know, they all scared the death out of me, you know, a gang of feisty lads <laughs> all looking well hard. And um, so, yeah, I, yeah, I'm very overwhelmed, really. A little bit intimidating, maybe. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. And, and overwhelmed. And that was beautiful. Yeah, and I was terrified. And then if you look at that first performance, I look like I'm being really cool. And actually, I'm just really terrified. <laughs> Madness on Kim's very first Top of the Pops with her, with that track, Return of the Lost Palmer 7, which got to number seven in 1981 by that time their seventh hit single Uh, so they were seasoned professionals by that time and even though you were literally the new kid on the block you you seem to be very sure of who you were Kim back then despite being you know pretty young you were only 20. With lots of attitude you know which is what every is the right of every 20 year old out there um you know you have as much attitude I mean I you know I did have a bit of an opinion about myself I have to say (laughs) and um (laughs) Yeah, so, uh, you know, I had my pride and I hated that cheesy grin stuff that people did to cameras. Uh, that was never going to be me. Um, you know, I, yeah. I used to think people like Lauren Bacall were the coolest people and, you know, they never smiled at cameras. You know, they just growled into a lens. <laughs> and um, I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to growl my way through uh, my 20s. And I, I used to be love it when photographers... A lot of men, I've got to say, but I'm, you know, I'm just mm. saying that, just throwing that out there. Um, that you used to say, come on, come, come on, King, give us a smile. And I used to growl at them, just right. like, <laughs> smiling at you. Um, so, yeah, just a, a bit of at- a lot of attitude for it, you know, but as, as is everyone's right at 20 years old. What about, um, what was your sort of big pinch me moments when you were riding the cusp of that first wave? And, and as you said, you travelled such a lot, you were... You, you know, hugely successful globally. Did you have any pinch me moments where you found yourself meeting, you know, a hero or playing on stage with somebody that you'd that you'd worshipped? You thought, well, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, I mean, I remember meeting all my heroes. You know, I me- remember it, meeting Elton John and meeting um, Stevie Wonder. Actually, I met him oh, wow. at uh, Ronnie Scott's when he was doing a, um, a, a an acoustic gig there and I went to that and shook his hand I remember walking into Radio 1 and Joni Mitchell was sat there doing an interview with someone um I was a huge Elvis Costello fan and I heard that he loved kids in America and had only good things to say about me Um, so yeah um many many you know I literally could sit here and tell you lots of gorgeous stories like that. Um, just really beautiful moments. And um, obviously later on in my career, in the, in the late 80s, I toured with Bowie and Michael Jackson, and they were two also incredible experiences for me as a performer. And, um, yeah. yeah. I, was, what, I, mean, I was to say, what was that like when you were touring with Bowie and, and Michael Jackson? I think, you know, perhaps what people don't realise is you're not all on a tour bus together. <laughs> You know, it's this, these two huge, you know, two separate organisations working in tandem, but often the timing is different. One's on stage, one's not. One's sound checking, one's not. So, how much of a crossover? How much interaction did you get with both of those artists? Well, obviously, more interaction with Bowie, um, but only slightly more. Um, none at all with Michael Jackson. Um, but then again, if I, you know, I, I do say. 
that very, you know, I mean, on any tour, it is quite an isolating experience. And if you're a big artist like Madonna or or Beyonce, you know, th that is the nature of touring. Is it is quite you're quite isolated. Um, so it didn't surprise me, particularly with Michael Jackson, that he was as isolated as he was. And it was such a, an immense privilege. I think I did about 32 or three shows with him uh, just to get to watch that man at the peak of his career. Mm. Uh, I remember the bad tour you know, so beautifully. Uh, my favourite song on that, of, on that tour was Another Part of Me. It just grew so incredibly. When you were backstage and you heard the band strike up Another Part of Me, oh, my, man, I used to just sit there in heaven think, I can't believe I'm on this tour. Oh, amazing. Um, I, I met him, you know, very, very briefly for a photograph and he was utterly charming. Um, but I, know, I didn't know him at all. The lovely thing about these conversations, because you know, I was starting out in my in my broadcasting world around at the same time that you were starting out in your musical career, and the conversations now are so lovely because we've got perspective. We're older, we're wiser, we're less insecure. Barriers are down. We don't really care that much. We just want to have a nice time. <laughs> um, the sort of the stakes don't seem quite so high, and these conversations are, are so. Um, revealing when people look back across the trajectory of their career. Did you ever go through a phase like that where you sort of were trying to shake it off and do something different? And have you come full circle to love it all again? Yeah, I mean, you've just, you just, <laughs> you've just described my life. Um, <laughs> I mean, Kids in America was, you know, I was 20, 21 when, when that all kicked off. And so, yeah, when it got to about, I think it was about 96 and I, I sort of took, took a con conscious decision to step out um, away from my career and away from Kids in America because I felt very uh, defined by that song. Um, a great song to be defined by, for sure, but this was like 15 years later yeah. and um, it didn't feel much fun anymore and being Kim Wilde wasn't much fun anymore. So that's when I did actually, I thought, retire. And I, I actually believed at that point, Jackie, that I wouldn't be ever singing Kids in America again. So it, it, emotionally, it was a big departure. Yeah. Um, I got married, I had children, I got into horticulture. Um, I, I had no intention of returning. And then I got lured back with the 80s concerts. Uh, the thought of being on tour with my, you know, all-time heroes, with, you know, ABC and uh, Heaven 17 and Clay Grogan and Altered Images and Steve Strange, and I just thought, how bad could that be? You know, my kids were a bit older. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try it, but it pro it'll probably be a bit, you know, not great, and the, probably no one will be that interested, and, and then I'll go home and I'll get back in the garden again. And, of course, the opposite happened. It kind of ignited a whole new resurgence of 80 stuff and I've been right. I've been sort of right riding the wave ever, ever since are you surprised um, or were you surprised at how much you enjoyed it again I was staggered absolutely staggered at how much it you know it was like the yeah it was a great feeling it was like the old Kim came back went oh thank god you didn't leave us behind <laughs> where have you been and, um, she's been buried, buried under piles of laundry in the school run for the last 15 yeah, years and nappies <laughs> and everything so yeah it was like you know she came kicking and screaming out oh yeah. kw right final question that we ask everybody and i do apologize in advance it's a tough one to ask Ask any artist. I won't say what's your favourite song of all time, but uh, let's say at the moment, um, what is a go-to song for you that's always uplifting or inspiring or comforting or gets you well up for uh, either getting ready to go on stage or unwinding you when you come off? Is there a go-to? I have to say, the one artist that got me up actually physically dancing in my living room was the Pet Shop Boys. Um, it's all right. It's such an uplifting song. It's you know, it's about music. You know, it's 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 the most um, yeah way of elevating yourself with music. It's, it's so beautiful. It really describes that in the song. Uh, it shall su shall succeed all the nations to come. Um, music um, is our life's foundation. I love that. And it, it feels very much to me like music is my life's foundation and it will always be there in spite of what this world throws at itself. Um, so It's All Right by the Pet Shop Boys. I love it.
The Pet Shop Boys with It's All Right, which got to number five in 1989, and the final track of the hour as chosen by our very special guest, Kim Wilde. Now, uh, you're appearing in Rotherham on September 18th at the Wentworth Festival, I know, then quite a few dates in Europe before you're back touring the UK in December, then another really big European tour early next year with plans to get back in the studio. So will you come back and see us when the new album's ready? I'd love to, yeah. Cheers, Kim. Thanks, Jackie. Kim Wilde, what delightful company she is with rock and roll joie de vivre still sparkling in those eyes.